15 minute or less lecture series, Anatomy, Chapter 13, the Cardiovascular System, the Heart. The heart is found in the thoracic cavity, approximately along the midline, and then the mediastinum found between the lungs. The heart is also in its own cavity called the pericardial cavity formed by the pericardium. The pericardium has two main portions. There's the outer superficial thick dense portion called the fibrous pericardium and is made up of tough, dense, irregular connective tissue. Deep to that is the serous pericardium, a two-layered structure that is filled with a little tiny bit of fluid. There is the parietal layer that lies against the fibrous pericardium and a visceral layer that lies on the heart itself. Uh, if you remember, the serous membranes are sort of like fluid-filled water bags. And if you push the organ in, you end up with the two layers, the visceral layer against the organ, the parietal layer against the thing surrounding the organ. Uh, the wall of the heart is made up of three main regions. The superficial region is the epicardium. Turns out the epicardium is made up of the visceral layer of the pericardium, as well as any fibroelastic tissue and adipose tissue on the surface of the heart. Uh, the adipose tissue helps to cushion the heart and hold uh, structures on its surface. The next layer is the myocardium, the thickest layer made up of the cardiac muscle tissue. And finally, the deepest layer is the endocardium, which is a thin, thin layer of endothelium and some connective tissue. It is there to make the inside of the chambers of the heart nice and smooth to reduce friction as all the blood vessels beat against it as it moves. Uh, here's a picture of a heart. In its four chambers, the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. Uh, you find on the surface of a heart these two little flaps. This is the right auricle and the left auricle, named because they look kind of like dog ears. The right auricle is part of the right atrium. The left auricle is part of the left atrium, and it helps to increase the volume of the atrii. And then the very point at the bottom of the heart is the apex. Uh, within, with, along the heart surfaces, you have these grooves or depressions called the sulci. You have the anterior interventricular sulcus along the front, lying between the ventricles. Uh, you have the coronary sulcus, the sulcus that goes all the way around that lies between the atria and the ventricles. And then there's also a posterior interventricular sulcus that lies between the two ventricles on the posterior side of the heart. Uh, if you look at the atrium, the right atrium, you see that it has openings for the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. It also has an opening for the coronary sinuses. These openings allow blood to enter the right atrium. There's also, uh, not seen in this picture, a tiny opening for the anterior cardiac vein that brings blood into the uh, right atrium. There is also these ridges along the walls of the heart called the pectinate muscle. These contract to help allow the atria to push the blood out during uh, the pumping of the heart. And then at the uh, inferior side of the right atrium is the opening for the right atrioventricular valve, also known as the tricuspid valve. This then leads to the right ventricle. So the right ventricle starts off with the tricuspid valve. As you can see here, the leaflets or cusps of the tricuspid valve push into the uh, right ventricle. There are three uh, cuspids on in the, on the uh, tricuspid valve. This is connected by these strings, these white little strings called the cordy tendony that connect to the papillary muscles on the walls of the ventricle. You also see on the uh, right ventricle a second valve, the pulmonary valve. This leads to the pulmonary trunk, which carries deoxygenated blood to the lungs so that when the ventricle contracts, the blood leaves the left ventricle and uh, sorry, the right ventricle and goes up into the pulmonary trunk past the pulmonary valve. Uh, finally, there is a wall between the two ventricles called the interventricular septum. The uh, pulmonary trunk leads to the left and right pulmonary veins, uh, sorry, arteries that carry blood to the lungs, and then the oxygenated blood returns via the left and right pulmonary veins. Just so you know, the pulmonary trunk is an artery. Uh, the left atrium then receives the blood, the oxygenated blood, from the pulmonary veins. So it has openings for those veins. And then it, of course, has the pectinate muscles on its walls. And then blood can leave the left atrium into the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve. The bicuspid valve 
Uh, just like the tricuspid valve has cusps, but in this case only two, they are connected by white little uh, ligaments to the papillary muscles on the walls of the left ventricle. Within the left ventricle or the right ventricle, you have these ridges along the wall. Uh, these are muscles and they're referred to as the trabeculi carni. Uh, there is, of course, an additional valve that you can't see in this picture called the aortic valve. Uh, when the left ventricle contracts, the blood will go through the atrioventricular valve into the aorta, the ascending portion of the aorta. And here is an image showing you all the different pieces of the heart coming together on this model. The heart is basically two pumps side by side pumping blood through the pulmonary circulation. That's to the lungs to get the deoxygenated blood reoxygenated. And the systemic circulation that then sends the blood throughout the body so that the oxygen can go to the various tissues. And the carbon dioxide can be delivered from the tissues and sent back to the heart. So two side-to-side -side pumps sending through the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation at the same time. Um, so the route of blood through the heart, it arrives into the right atrium through the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the coronary sinus, or the anterior cardiac vein. It will then pass through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Again, this is deoxygenated blood entering the right ventricle. That will then be pushed through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk, go through the left and right pulmonary arteries to the lungs where the blood will release its carbon dioxide and the oxygen will be received by the blood. The oxygen blood will then arrive uh, via the left and right pulmonary veins into the left atrium. Blood will then pass through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. Again, this is now oxygenated blood. And then when the ventricle contracts, it will send the blood through the aortic valve into the aorta where it will enter the systemic circulation and bring the oxygen to all the tissues of the body. And then this will all uh, continue again and again and again, a continuous cycle of blood passing through the two pumps of the heart. And note the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart do contract at the same time. Uh, the left ventricle has a much thicker wall than the right ventricle. Why is this? It is because the left ventricle needs to give a more forceful contraction to send the blood through the entire body, while the right ventricle only has to send the blood to the lungs, which aren't that far away. There is what's called the fiber skeleton of the heart. This is four dense connective rings that surround the four valves of the heart. What we're looking at with this cartoon picture is a superior view of the heart with the atrium removed. So this is the top of the ventricles and the valves that are at the top, the superior sides of the ventricles. So these four dense connective rings act as a attachment for the valves themselves. They help to prevent the valves from overstretching. They also are insertion points for the cardiac muscle tissues themselves. And they prevent the spread of the action potentials through the cardiac muscle tissue from the atria to the ventricles. This will be important. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, the atrioventricular valves are the bicuspid valve and the tricuspid valve. Uh, these valves have either three cusps for the tricuspid valve or two cusps or leaflets for the bicuspid valve. Uh, their structure, where the cusps are attached via the cordy tendony to the papillary muscles, are very critical for their function. When they relaxed, they allow blood to pass from the atria into the ventricles. But when the ventricles contract, the papillary muscles contract, pulling on the cordy tendony. This prevents the flaps, the cusps, from inverting so that the cusps of the valves act as a block, preventing blood from going back into the atria when the ventricles contract. This is very, very important. We want efficient uh, contraction when the heart is pumping. The semilunar valves are the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve. They are distinct in structure. The semilunar valves are basically three little tissue pockets uh, at the border between the ventricles and the arteries they attach to, either the pulmonary trunk or the uh, aorta. Uh, these three little uh, pockets of tissue form these little cups so that when the blood leaves the ventricles into the arteries, uh, as soon as the ventricles start to relax, the blood will back up into those cups, filling them, blocking the route back into the ventricles, preventing the blood from backing up into the heart. 
Valve disorders, there is stenosis, where there's a narrowing of the heart valve. Uh, for instance, in mitral stenosis, this would be scar forming or maybe a congenital defect that narrows the bicuspid valve, uh, making it harder for blood to pass through. Uh, there's also insufficiency. So this is a failure of the valve to close completely. When this happens, there'll be a backflow of blood into um, either the atria or the ventricle. Um, valve defects are usually just observed and paid attention to unless they start to cause problems with daily activities, in which case they might be surgically repaired or replaced. And for your reference, a heart murmur is basically a slightly different sound to the heart when it's beating. That is a sign of some sort of valve issue. All right, coronary circulation is the circulation to take blood to the heart itself. The heart is a living organ. It needs oxygen and nutrients. So we have the right and left coronary arteries that come directly off the aorta, the ascending aorta. Almost as soon as blood leaves the heart, it'll enter the uh, right or left coronary arteries. Uh, from the left coronary artery, it'll split into the anterior interventricular branch and the circumflex branch carrying blood around to the left side of the heart. Uh, the right coronary artery will then split into the marginal branch, which is awfully small, and also into the posterior interventricular branch. This carries oxygenated blood throughout the heart. Uh, these arteries will then further branch into smaller and smaller arteries that will then connect up uh, to the veins. So the main veins of coronary circulation carrying the deoxygenated blood out away from the heart. You have the great cardiac vein on the left side. This is a very large vein shown in blue. Uh, you have the anterior cardiac vein that empties directly into the right atrium. You have the small cardiac vein and the uh, middle cardiac vein. And then all three of these cardiac veins will end up emptying their blood into the coronary sinus on the posterior side of the heart that then empties into the right atrium. And this just shows there's an error in our picture in our book. There should be a line showing that the anterior cardiac vein connects to the right atrium. All right, myocardial ischemia is uh, basically uh, uh, reduced blood flow to the myocardium, to the heart tissues to low oxygen levels, weakening the cardiac muscle cells. Uh, this can also lead to pain called uh, angina pectoris. Uh, myocardial infarction is a heart attack where there's complete blockage to a coronary artery. This leads to a death in some of the cardiac tissue of the heart. Cardiac, uh, the heart will weaken and potentially lead to death. Oh, and there's also angina pectoris. Uh, conduction system, the movement of electricity through the heart to control the contractions of the heart. It all starts in the sinoatrial node. This will then cause the uh, electrical impulse to pass through the tissues of the atria, causing them to contract in unison. It then is delayed at the atrioventricular node, delaying the travel of it to the ventricles. Uh, it will then pass through the atrioventricular bundle into the right and left uh, bundled branches that go to the apex of the heart. Then it will enter the Purkinje fibers, which will then spread this uh, electrical action potential into the um, tissues of the ventricles, causing them to contract together, starting at the apex and up to push the blood out. It's usually a 0.2 second delay. Uh, cardiac cycle, the actual beating of the heart. It starts off with the relaxation period when the entire heart is relaxed in the atrial systole, when the atria contract, putting the blood into the ventricles, and the ventricular systole, when the atria relaxes and the ventricles contract the blood into the arteries and then it all goes around and around in a lovely cycle. The uh, sounds of the heart, there's S1 sound, the lub, which is caused when the atrioventricular valves contract, preventing the blood from going to the atria, and the S2 sound or dub, when the uh, semilunar valves contract, preventing blood from going back into the ventricles. Exercise is great, it increases function and cardiac output of the heart, increases the amount of hemoglobin and capillaries in the muscle tissue, coronary artery disease, is often caused by atherosclerosis tract, black plaques building up in the arteries, causing them to get thinner and narrow. And then should a uh, blood clot develop, it could cause blockage in there, causing a myocardial infarction or stroke. Blood blockage is bad. Uh, it can be uh, diagnosed through resting electrocardiogram, which is a non-invasive way to check the electrical activity of the heart. It can be done by radionucleotide imaging, by sending electric uh, materi uh, radioactive materials into the bloodstream to check on what's going on in the heart. By echocardiogram, using sound waves to look at the inside of the heart, or cardiac catheterization, sending up a little camera up into the heart through blood vessels. 
Uh, you can do cardio artery bypass surgery or, or a coronary angioplasty to correct this issue.